There are more people being trafficked, more people in slavery today than at any other point in human history. If people think this is happening to someone else's kid, someone else's child, in someone else's community, you're wrong. Three teenage girls who were living in a group home in uh, Mount Pleasant, they ran away um, and they uh, had the bad luck to meet a, uh, their captor at a gas station and he offered them the moon. Pimps will have their, their girls recruiting other girls on everything from Facebook, Instagram, Kick, it doesn't matter. To hear these men talk about these girls um, as property, within three days, all I have to do is pet her head like a dog and she'll do anything that I want her to do. Many times they'll be videotaped and blackmailed to continue the activity. They now become property of that pimp. I had a client that I think I missed. I think she was being labor trafficked. She was being forced, threatened, you know, to do things against her will. Matter of fact, she used the term, he's using me as a slave. And thinking back on it now, what more did I need from that? Her mother was involved in the um, sex trafficking trade um, and was actually trafficking her daughter. We initially received a 911 phone call of a, a residential structure fire, and upon arrival we learned that there were potentially five victims in the basement of the structure. And unfortunately, five Mexican nationals perished in that fire, uh, ranging in age from 16 to 23. Kids coming out of foster care, growing up, being kicked out of the house, um, LGBT community. If you come out to your parents or family, they find out and then they kick them out of the house. And I'm dressed up, given half a volume, and they take me out on a stroll at 15. And I'm told, you run. You say anything to the police. I'm killing your mother, your brother, your sister. I'm killing them all. And you will never see the light of day. You will never get away from me. I'm Dr. Herbert Smitherman, a member of the Michigan Human Trafficking Commission. I would like to begin by thanking you for joining us today for this very important CME training program. Over the next hour, we will be joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. James Blessman, who will serve as moderator and host and help us to gain background and useful information to help combat this heinous crime. This is a crime that often goes unrecognized. However, 88% of those who are trafficked are seen by a healthcare provider at some point. As medical professionals, we are seeing these patients and we don't want to lose an opportunity to identify and protect someone from an environment of unspeakable abuse. With Dr. Blessman as our guide, this thought-provoking program will serve to familiarize you with the newly enacted Michigan and federal statutes, signs and symptoms of trafficking, recommended interventions and treatment protocols, along with observational techniques to identify potential victims. Please join us now as we familiarize you with human trafficking, its impact and consequences. Dr. Blessman. It is with pleasure and conviction that I will serve as your host and guide for this important CME training. We have created a program that we feel will inform with a certain authority. Hearing from those presenters, who have firsthand knowledge of the crimes of trafficking and its resultant victimizations. In total, we will hear from law enforcement agents, federal and state prosecutors, judges, advocacy clinicians, and physicians, as well as social service and mental health professionals. We will end with a set of experience-based recommendations that will assist in the identification and treatment of trafficked and exploited individuals. Many times we can be the first to recognize and help a trafficked victim, though at present we often miss these opportunities. We must set a new bar for our helping to make the invisible visible, turning a life of despair in a new direction. We will begin by familiarizing ourselves with our newly enacted anti-trafficking statutes and required reporting requirements, hearing first from Michigan's Attorney General, Bill Schutte. You know, human trafficking takes you know, a variety of different forms. M more often than not, human trafficking involves young women, but it can also involve 
uh, young men as well. And these folks are looking for money and they're abusing people. And that's why, whether you're in the state of Michigan or any part of this country, or frankly around the, uh, the globe, this is something that needs to be combated. The crime of human trafficking in Michigan has evolved since 2006. Uh, the current state of the law includes the fact that there are four ways to commit the crime of human trafficking. The basic is forced labor services, which is essentially labor services obtained through force fraud or coercion. Uh, that's right in line with the federal law on human trafficking. In terms of cases that are brought in the federal system or the state system, typically what happens is a collaboration. We'll talk with our counterparts in the state system about a particular case. There's some things the state system does better than we do. They typically can move a case through their system faster than we can. But there are some cases that are better suited toward federal prosecution. Um, sometimes if it involves an international component, for example, where the victims are from overseas, uh, many times we can um, facilitate um, getting a visa for the victim, for example. So there's a lot of coordination that goes on between federal and state prosecutors to make sure that at the end of the day, we're really focusing on serving the victim. It's where an individual has control over another individual using force, fraud, and coercion. When those three elements are in play, then we have human trafficking under the legal definition, and we can prosecute those crimes. And force might be something like, you know, beatings or sleep deprivation or even food deprivation. And fraud might be um, a promise of something where they've been told, you're coming to the United States to um, teach Russian as a second language. And instead, they show up and they're put into a strip club. If they have been smuggled into the United States, they don't feel like they can make um, a police report about that because they were complicit and compliant with their the smuggling. And, and that's, again, a border law violation, but not you know, not something that we will charge them for if they're a trafficking victim. What I've seen is there's a heightened awareness. So what happens is people are now able to identify what human trafficking is. You know, back in the early 2000s, we all kind of envisioned it as kind of something that happened overseas and, you know, the force uh, where people were locked up in, you know, basements in foreign countries. Well, now we realize that, that human trafficking is, is right here in our own backyards. It wasn't until 2000 that Congress passed the federal anti-trafficking law. And so it's a very new area of the law and also underreported. While our awareness of human trafficking and its reporting is on the rise, an accurate accounting of the crime remains underreported. Why? As we will hear from our anti-trafficking authorities, victims are often difficult to spot on purpose. Fear of disclosure, threats of reprisals, Forced drug dependencies, habituation, shame, physical and emotional deficits all create barriers to communication. It is often said that these victims are all around us, yet they are unseen, invisible. We need to be better attuned in order to identify those who are at greatest risk. In this chapter, Epidemiology, we will seek a better understanding and appreciation for the prevalence and invisible nature of these crimes and hopefully will gain a better insight into the unthinkable traumas faced and exercise greater empathy for these victims. It is often imagined, can't these people just walk away? If only it was that easy. Each victim that we've dealt with uh, in our cases mentions the fact that the trafficker indicated that he would hurt or kill the victim's family. And in some ways, that's the most insidious, all-encompassing sort of control that one needs. Human trafficking is happening in every single community in the United States. It's happening in all 50 states. It is happening in the suburbs. It is happening in rural areas. It is happening in urban areas. So if people think this is happening to someone else's kid, someone else's child, in someone else's community, you're wrong. It has no boundaries. It has no limits. I don't care what your income is, where you live, in a gated community, in the ghetto, it makes no difference. This epidemic is, is huge. Slavery is human trafficking. But to put that in perspective, there are more people being trafficked, more people in slavery today than at any other point in human history. And that kind of drives it home.
when you listen to the stories of these uh, victims, it is, it is just insane. I mean, the, I think the youngest victim that has been put forth to us was six months old six month old being passed around and these people are preying on on significantly vulnerable populations people often ask me where did this phenomenon of human trafficking come from why is this suddenly such a big deal i think it's always been out there but we haven't been aware of it because we haven't known how to recognize these victims drugs is the biggest industry human trafficking is right up under there why because with drugs you only get to sell drugs once with a victim you get to sell them over and over and over again. We know um, that there have been raids of restaurants in the Upper Eastern Lower Peninsula. Uh, we know that there have been uh, claims of agriculture workers in the Southwest Michigan farm area. Uh, we know that there has been uh, hotel sex trafficking along the Upper West Coast of Michigan, even up into the Traverse City area. And then, of course, we have the Southeast Michigan area, which probably by virtue of the increased population in the state has probably the most uh, significant numbers of trafficking cases. Certainly people who are involved in organized crime, for instance, uh, might be running sex trafficking networks. Uh, those are probably the people we would imagine most easily. Other people who hire a servant to come and work in their home from another country, we might never ever suspect. Human traffickers prey on the vulnerable, whether it be stalking youths in shopping malls or online searching as teens peruse questionable, even dangerous social media sites. Make no mistake, young men are targets too. Traffickers seek out the needy, those who face rejection, a broken or violent home life, absentee fathers and mothers, drug abuse, alcoholism, sexual and physical abuses. All of these serve to drive children, as well as adults, from the anguish that they've suffered at home. Away from their home or homeland, fending for themselves, all it takes is to meet up with the wrong person. And in this scenario, the predator is ready and waiting. And you know, if you're a kid, if you're a teenager and you're out on the street, um, what do you have to support yourself? You can sell drugs or you can sell your body. Um, and they find themselves getting into a situation uh, that escalates out of their control very quickly. And then they feel like they have nowhere to turn for help. So that's one category. And the other we find are um, international victims, maybe victims who came to this country undocumented. Maybe they paid a fee to someone for their assistance to get here. Um, there's often some sort of bait and switch involved. They were told they could come and work off a debt and come have a, the American dream when in fact, uh, they get here and they find themselves in a forced labor situation or a sex trafficking situation. They're told that they've got to continue to work to pay off their debt. They're threatened with uh, disclosure to law enforcement or with harm to their relatives back home unless they comply with the demands of their captors. Now let's hear from Dr. Jordan Greenbaum, a nationally recognized authority on medical evaluations of abused children. She'll give us her thoughts on what to watch for in trafficked individuals. Dr. Greenbaum? So many children, many women have risk factors, but many don't. Uh, and so it can happen to a 16-year-old child who's an honor student uh, living at home on the cheerleading squad with, no, with a stable family and no risk factors. That person can be sort of lured uh, via the internet uh, and eventually sort of lured into the world. Um, and that we have to always in the back of our mind see that as a possibility so that if we see some patients who are presenting with what are common consequences of uh, human trafficking, such as uh, drug ingestion, drug overdose, suicide attempts, sexually transmitted infections, pelvic inflammatory diseases, uh, significant injuries, anogenital trauma, acute sexual assault, all of those things, uh, then we should, in the back of our mind, think about the possibility that this child, this woman, this man, may be a victim of human trafficking and make some uh, effort to build rapport and ask some of the questions. So many kids have these smartphones, and I hope parents understand that that is a window to the world. I mean, never before has a child predator in New Jersey been able to climb into your 13-year-old daughter's bedroom window through her cell phone. Sexting. 
that's become a big issue. And I know that it's talked about in many different schools and organizations as well. What's happening is where you have boyfriend and girlfriend who break up, the boyfriend sends an explicit photo of his girlfriend to his friends. I'm gonna send these pictures to your family. I'm gonna send these pictures to everybody in school, unless you now work for me. Pimps will have their, their girls recruiting other girls on everything from Facebook, Instagram, Kick, it doesn't matter. They'll, they're talking to them in any venue that they can get. So they're utilizing all of these social media apps as well in order to re recruit more girls. But now she has the iPhone, she's got the iPad, you know, everything. I mean, he, he's right, he could be talking to her while sitting right next to me. To hear these men talk about these girls um, as property, you know, it's easy to get a girl. All I have to do is go to a mall and stand there and wait for a girl to connect her eyes to mine. And then I say something to her like, you look really good in those jeans. And if she just looks away and keeps walking, I think that's not my girl. Maybe the second girl I say, you look good in those jeans too. And maybe she giggles with her friend and she keeps on walking. And I think that's not my girl. But the third girl that says, that replies to you look good in those jeans with, do you think is the girl that maybe I can take home and she'll love me, um, she can call me daddy. Within three days, all I have to do is pet her head like a dog and she'll do anything that I want her to do. Practice makes perfect. You know, they, they practice on who they approach. Traffickers succeed through ultimate control grand puppeteers, if you will, and this is achieved in many unspeakable ways. When some folks suggest that a kept person should be able to escape their captor, after listening to the following firsthand accounts from law enforcement and victim advocates, it becomes pretty clear how unlikely it is for a victim to escape without the help of authorities or just plain caring and concerned citizens. Here then is how traffickers target and victimize the unsuspecting. The traffickers don't really meet any particular profile other than they are, they are evil. Uh, these are people who see other human beings as a commodity uh, that can be used as a profit center. They are manipulative, they are deceptive, and they are patient. They will groom their victims sometimes for a long period of time. They'll start to remove away all their um, all their safety nets in life. They'll start to tell them things like, I'm the only one that really cares about you. You can't really trust your parents. You can't trust your friends. I'm the only one that really loves you. And once they start to do that, then there's a, some point where they start to turn them to prostitution. They get hooked on the drugs. The drugs then become a way to control the victims because they then use the drugs to keep them uh, uh, in the trafficking business, so it's a it's a it's a cycle. This is who these people are. They're not nice people who traffic, and they're profit driven. They're greed driven. They're power driven. It's not uncommon for them to get one hundred and eighty thousand dollars for one girl uh, for one year. So they realize the renew uh, renewable commodity associated with that, and then and do that. I've actually seen juveniles pimping other juveniles. So I mean, there really is no face to this game anymore. We've seen instances where it's a family member, it's an uncle or a parent who is um, trafficking their child, um, or it's a, a boyfriend who seems like the perfect boyfriend, no alarm bells, not not somebody who's slimy or what you see on TV, but just the, you know this great guy, um, and that's the entryway into trafficking. So when you're dealing with thinking about who traffickers are, you are dealing with these international kingpins, the Chinese triads and um, Russian organized crime and Korean organized crime and all these different organized crime groups um, from all the drug traffickers from Central and South America and Asia. Um, you're also dealing with that uh, stereotypical image of who might be that pimp controlling his stable. The key thing to think about when thinking about traffickers, this could be anybody. It could be anybody. And unfortunately, it's horrific enough to even think about parents and step-parents um, using their children or their stepchildren and selling them for money. Over 80% of trafficked individuals have some interaction with the healthcare community. However, they often go unrecognized. If we are to break the bonds of entrapment and abuse, 
we must not miss these opportunities to help those victimized minors or adults who come through our doors. You must first realize that they have concerns for identification, with fears about trusting someone with whom they have no relationship, even though the relationship with the perpetrator is so toxic. A victim's readiness to disclose the nature of their captivity to a healthcare professional will only occur if the patient feels safe and can trust the intentions of the healthcare provider. Such trust and rapport isn't typically achieved in the first encounter. Even in cases where empathy has been established, victims may only disclose their situation after repeated encounters and inquiries. Our challenge then is to encourage the suspected victims to disclose their predicament using a trauma-based model of interaction. We must be empathetic and very aware of the fears that factor into our patients' interactions. Once again, let's hear from those providers who can speak to the challenges we face as we encounter an attempt to treat the invisible victims of trafficking. Emergency rooms are, are classically very busy. This is a, a lot of where this, this population is interacting. And if you're in a busy emergency room, putting a lot of that together uh, sometimes can be difficult, especially if the person is not acknowledging it. Many victims don't see themselves as victims, and the vast majority are not going to come in and say, I'm a victim, I need your help. We've had two kids come in and say they, they need help, but the rest of them adamantly deny that they're victims. They don't see themselves as victims. They see themselves as working with their, quote, boyfriend, uh, or working for their family, or doing something that is justifiable, or uh, they may see themselves as in a position that is the only way for them to live, and that there is no uh, alternative. So they don't see it as something that they are being rescued from. And I think that that is hard for us to understand as healthcare providers. So we have to sort of go the extra step and identify the patients rather than having them identify themselves. Remember that they've been brainwashed to believe you can't trust anybody and that um, law enforcement and medical personnel are not to be trusted. They'll lock you up, they'll put you away, they'll do whatever the threats are. So um, they're scared to death. They're afraid to say anything. Um, and they know that if they do, there's gonna be a consequence to that. They live a very violent lifestyle. They come into the emergency room because they have uh, an outbreak of herpes and it's their first one, so it's terrible and they're in the emergency room. How did this happen? Well, I'm not gonna tell you that I prostituted because I don't want you to judge me. I don't want you to call the cops. And it's none of your business. The trafficker has told them, there's no one out here that cares about you. No one out here is going to believe you. There's nowhere you can go. There's nothing out here for you but me. And he or she believes that. And the trafficker is banking on them believing it. There is a litany of prescribed observational techniques and skill sets that we employ as we look at the presented injury or infection. While our training can have us looking for causes of injury and physical traumas, we should also be looking for the underlying stresses, evidence of emotional distress, mental health issues, drug and alcohol dependencies, social distress, and past unattended injuries that might be associated with some sort of prolonged victimization. We refer to this as trauma-informed care, and it is this victim-centered encounter we should encourage. Some of the things that we can really be aware of um, are uh, the incidence of multiple episodes of STIs. So sexually transmitted infections are very common. Uh, in one study, about two-thirds of the trafficking survivors said they'd had an STI during their period of trafficking. We see a lot of gonorrhea and chlamydia in our kids. So if a child says, yes, I've had gonorrhea twice before, and she's only 14, um, that should raise questions. If there's a history of a pregnancy, pregnancy and an abortion, uh, if there's evidence on exam of inflicted trauma, so injuries that are in ordinarily protected places, uh, on the inner thighs, for example, on the neck, on the torso, anywhere on the torso, the upper arms, um, and if they look suspicious like cigarette burns or loot marks, Kids will say, yes, I've been beaten and burned, um, sometimes choked. Uh, so there may be evidence of inflicted trauma, and that should raise concerns as well and ask and, and uh, prompt the physician to ask some questions about that. 
Um, if she's got a tattoo of a man's name or a sexually explicit tattoo, uh, that might be a sign of branding, which is very common. The, the girls are actually branded, girls and women are branded by the traffickers. So they have tattoos, uh, maybe a barcode or something sexually explicit. One girl that we had, um, one patient of ours had across the bottom, lower part of her back, she had a tattoo that said cash only on her, the lower part of her back. So very explicit. Other people have um, the man's name. And so asking, gee, how'd you get that tattoo? You know, who decided to get that tattoo? Did, was that your choice? When did you get it? Who was with you? You know, those kinds of questions. The behavioral health and mental health trauma is probably even more significant and more lasting. Um, and that's trauma to the brain. PTSD is the diagnosis that we would give to anyone that's a victim of abuse or trafficking. PTSD is given for anyone that's experienced an adverse effect or adverse experience, um, whether they've experienced it physically, emotionally, or sexually, or in any way, or they've even viewed it, you're going to have things like depression and anxiety and hypervigilance and an inability to trust. It's going to affect your memory. It's going to affect every aspect of you on an emotional level. So it's important to understand that treatment of PTSD or identifying PTSD, there's many nuances. It's emotional, it's psychological, and it's physical. Trauma bonding is a thing that occurs, um, is, is, a, is a known entity that has occurred, and we tend to see it in these victims where, as bizarre as it sounds, as horrible as their life is, they ultimately develop this, this emotional bond with their captor. And that makes it extremely hard um, for them to get out of their situation. You cannot go through the kind of trauma uh, both mentally and physically, that these women and boys and, and adults go through without having uh, um, scars for the rest of their life. And so how we manage that and help them manage that, I think is our responsibility. And I have talked to clients where there's nothing there. It's empty. And I'm looking at them and they're looking at me and I'm, I'm looking into their eyes and I'm trying to find them. and. It's difficult sometimes. We know that major depression and suicidality are very common among trafficking victims. In one study, about 40% of the trafficking survivors uh, had tried to commit suicide at one point during their trafficking experience. So we know that there are tremendous psychological issues going on with the victims. So we do those screenings, uh, and then we make referrals. Before the child leaves, we call authorities, we call um, service providers to try to figure out where can this child go tonight? Where can she be safe? What shelter can she go to? And what are her long-term needs? Uh, so that we work as a multidisciplinary team to try to figure out how best to help her. In this discussion, we will learn about guiding principles of assessment and care. A trauma-informed and culturally sensitive attitude and approach is best. Recognize that routine procedures may trigger past experiences be felt as threatening and may even result in a re-traumatizing event. You send me to a doctor or a psychiatrist, I don't trust them going through the door. So when they're asking me questions, I know how to mask myself to tell them what they need to hear so I can hurry up and get out of there because I'm uncomfortable. It's looking deeper, it's doing a full history and physical, it's really trying to figure out if there's something else going on which a lot of times you're only going to pick up if you do a really good physical exam. We have to really take a trauma-informed approach to this. We have to assume that any child, woman, man who is a victim has been through incredible trauma that we can only begin to understand. And so as they're talking to us, if we're asking them questions about what's happened and they're telling us that they've been locked in a closet for a week or beaten and choked or burned or hung up by their hands, it's extremely traumatizing for them and they're probably re-experiencing that. And the last thing we want to do is re-traumatize them during our interview. So it's really important to sort of monitor the child or the, the woman or the man while you're talking to them. And if they seem to be getting distressed, really sort of back off and try to avoid um, eliciting a lot of distress. Our objectives for this trauma-informed interaction are to reduce the chance for re-traumatization, highlight patient strengths and resilience, enhance self-confidence, promote healing and recovery, and support the development of coping mechanisms. Trauma-informed questioning with a victim-centered interaction is non-threatening, non-accusatory, 
and thereby reduces anxiety. Most important, it conveys that the medical staff respects and has great interest in serving the needs of the patient. This helps us to build trust. Red flags are the telltale signs to watch for that at-risk patients may exhibit during an examination. These indicators suggest that further investigation and questioning may be a benefit. Indicators may be physical, emotional, and or circumstantial. There are red flags specifically for minor victims of sex trafficking, as well as for adult victims of sex trafficking. And there are red flags for minor and adult victims of labor trafficking. Keep in mind too, that victims are often forced into multiple criminal enterprises. Let's hear from our subject matter experts who will offer their own watch list or red flags from their own personal experience in helping trafficked individuals. Unfortunately, the signs look like so many other things. It can look like a sexual assault. It can look like relationship violence. It can look like a random attack of violence. It can look like a work incident from a day laborer. It can look like um, drugs. It can look like mental health. Unfortunately, all the signs of sex trafficking or labor trafficking look like something else that comes through the door. If it didn't, well, we would already know. So certainly human traffic, trafficking victims may have red flags of physical abuse, the same things you might see from a domestic violence victim, and I'm sure medical caregivers are well equipped to recognize those. But some different ones that you might see in a case of a victim who's being trafficked would include um, things like not having access to their own identification documents. You know, someone else keeps my ID for me. That might be one red flag. Um, another would be inability to communicate directly with friends and family members. So I, you know, I don't talk to my parents. I don't talk to my friends. I don't talk to my family. That might be another uh, red flag. And then I suppose other things might be indications of lack of sleep, uh, lack of food, and lack of medical attention in a reasonable period of time. Injury patterns are really important, probably some of the most important. So if we start seeing injury patterns in areas that we wouldn't normally see injuries, that would be a red flag. For example, injuries to the neck, maybe from being choked, injuries to the upper arms from being grabbed or held down, injuries to the torso, intraoral injuries, all things that would be concerning and that would maybe prompt us to do a little bit more of an investigation. When doing GYN exams, their cervixes are just torn apart. Um, they may or may not have many infections or histories of infections. They may have examples where they've had many pregnancies. Some of those were terminated by a medical professional. Other times they were terminated by force. You should watch for a patient who is overly defensive, overly voiceful in terms of, I don't need anybody, I got this, I can take care of myself. A lot of that is, is, is fake, but you have to put that forward in the street in order to keep away predators. If a child doesn't have a school, um, can't name what school he or she goes to, um, obviously that's a problem. If an adult, um, for instance, doesn't know their address. They might know what street they live on, but they don't know the number. Um, if they don't have any friends, if they're not permitted to go to church. So with children, um, being a runaway or homeless youth, fake ID, no ID, dating an older controlling male, um, access to uh, new hair, new shoes, new clothes, when they come from a background where they don't normally have access to that, Condoms, lubricant, baby wipes, um, cell phone, um, that sort of thing, gang involvement. If you add labor trafficking into that, the broken bones that don't heal correctly is a, is a pretty common one, but poor eyesight where someone's been forced to work in, the, in really dark environments because um, they don't want to pay for lights in that room or, or whatever the case might be. Um, injuries that were never treated. If those things are popping up, I would have all sorts of concerns. I want to stress that patient safety above all is paramount when interviewing suspected victims. Questioning should be done strictly in private, making sure that there is no opportunity for those accompanying the patient to overhear the patient-doctor conversation. Personal items such as cell phones should not accompany the patient. If privacy cannot be accomplished, 
it is advised not to pursue questioning, especially if the patient is to be released to the accompanying persons. If privacy can be secured, your conversation should be conducted in a non-threatening, supportive, empathetic manner. Some patients will feel more comfortable if a same-sex practitioner intervenes. If a translator is required, select only a healthcare staff person or a known third party to translate. Make certain that the questions and answers are kept confidential. My fiance and I went to uh, the doctor, went to the emergency the other day because I had an ailment. And I was asked some questions by a physician's assistant, no, by a nurse. And the thing she asked me was, are you safe at home? Now, he's sitting right there. Now, what if he would have been a pimp and you would have said something like that? Are you safe at home? And I'm going to tell you, yeah. When actually she might not be. There are, of course, specific protocols and procedures when healthcare workers encounter and treat minors in any instance. However, the questioning of minors who have been forced into the commercial sex trade present unique challenges requiring specific precautions in order to ensure patient safety. Let's now hear from law enforcement professionals sharing their ideas and concerns regarding victim inquiry. It's very important for victims of human trafficking for them to feel safe before they cooperate with law enforcement. We're not going to take you write you a ticket for prostitution, and throw you right back in that situation. We're putting you in a safe spot. We're letting you know you're in a safe place. Now can we start that dialogue so that not only can we bring these traffickers to justice, see if there's anyone else in danger, and can we stop this from happening in this particular venue? They don't want to tell you their whole life story, but they want help for something. You know, what is it um, that I can help you with right now that will make you feel better, feel safer? You know, is there anything that I can attend to um, that you have a need for right now and see what it is. It could just be, I need a meal. I think one of the risk factors for uh, commercial sexual exploitation of children um, is if the youth identifies themselves as um, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning youth, and those, those kids are at high risk. One of the reasons I think they are is, in many cases, they're thrown out of the home. Uh, the parent says, I can't deal with you being homosexual, just get out of here. And so they're forced on their own. Uh, they're very isolated and they're looking for social acceptance and other people who will understand them. And so they're very high risk. It can start with triage, soon as they walk in. The, the triage nurse can be like, something's not right. You know, I see some bruises, or, you know, she seems a little anxious, or the, the, the trafficker is just controlling the entire conversation. Every time she speaks, she looks at him. Let's red flag her chart. So when it passes down, we say, okay, we got somebody on alert. In the state of Michigan, healthcare providers who have a reasonable cause to believe a minor is suffering physical or emotional injury resulting from exploitation or human trafficking are mandated to report their suspicion first to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and then to law enforcement and finally to the National Human Trafficking Hotline. Know also that there is a human trafficking task force made up of representation from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Homeland Security Investigations, the Michigan State Police, as well as local law enforcement. It also includes legal advocates, safe houses, shelters, and both non-governmental and faith-based organizations. Their efforts have led to increased scrutiny and victim assistance, where quick and effective responses have enhanced investigations and secured victim safety. So that doctor, uh, that nurse, that triage op, you know, specialist, their job is if a girl's coming in and uh, is beat up, uh, was sexually assaulted, and if they even get a seemingly hint that there was money exchanged, they are mandated reporter to call. Yeah, the law makes it uh, a crime to commit sex trafficking involving adults or children, but in the um, area of adults, we have to prove an additional element, that the defendant used force, 
uh, fraud or coercion. But when a child is the victim, um, it's sort of implicit that there was some sort of coercion involved. So we don't have to prove that additional element. The penalties are also higher when children are the victims. If a child's under 14, for example, there's a mandatory minimum sentence of 15 years in prison. If they're between that window of 14 and 17 years old, there's a 10-year mandatory minimum. Um, and, and the mandatory minimum does not exist for adults. However, I will tell you that the sentences in these cases uh, can be extreme up to life. The problem is, is you don't always know how old they are. They don't, they don't dress like a 13 or 14 or 15 year old. Uh, they many times will have fake ID. They don't offer that information to you. So if I can't prove that's the case, it makes it really tough for me to be able to go after that. If I know they're a minor and I can prove it, now I have law enforcement behind me that can help me assist getting that person out of their situation. The state of Michigan has done a wonderful job uh, in defining the law, and they've also done a great job through the Attorney General's Office of educating and training Child Protective Services. Now, that is always, whether it's law enforcement, us, um, hospitals, private industry, that's always going to be your first call. That comes with the training that they've had, the expertise that they have, and we have to have that interaction because if there's a situation, we've got to remove that child from the situation, we've got to be able to place that child in a safe environment. So Child Protective Services is always a great resource for someone to call. The CPS phone number is 1-855-444-3911. The Michigan state and federal laws protecting adult victims of trafficking differ from those that protect youth under 18. We will make clear what those differences are. First, be certain that the same principles apply if adult victims are forced into any labor against their will by means of force, fraud, or coercion. In many cases, trafficked adults have been subjected to horrific abuses well before the age of majority. So then it gets trickier though when a person's over 18, right? So then you have over 18 year old, well there's no mandated call there, but what the hospital could choose to do is that it's a mandated social work visit. It's a mandated counseling session. It's nobody's allowed in the room with her for so long, or him. On the adult side, you, you see things like multiple pregnancies or multiple abortions. Uh, you see things like rotting teeth, broken bones that never healed correctly, poor medical history. Um, they, the, this type of sustained abuse just wears people out. Let them know they can answer what they want to answer. They don't have to answer anything they're not comfortable with. And let them feel like they're in control. Remember that their whole world has been turned upside down. And the last thing that they have in their world is control. And so we want them to feel empowered to give us information. We want them to feel comfortable. And we want them to feel safe. I remember being stabbed and found and taken to the emergency room. And I remember some nurses there saying if she wasn't out doing what she was doing this would have never happened I would have rather died alone in the streets than to die in a cold hospital where people are supposed to care if they feel that this person is low life or this person, you know, willingly has chosen to get into this profession and they enjoy it, that's how it's going to come across, condescending, you know, sarcasm. Um, but if you know that this person possibly is a suspect of human trafficking, you know right out the gates that this is not something that they've chosen. So you're going to approach it a little bit differently. We assume that everybody who comes through our door is a trauma survivor, and that way we know that we always uh, treat people with respect. We give them opportunities to tell their story. I mean, those are those are things that you would do um, for anybody, but it's especially important for a trauma survivor. So we give them back as much choice as we possibly can. For adult patients, at this time, health care providers are not required to report suspected instances of human trafficking to law enforcement. Should a physician or other healthcare professional suspect their patient may be a victim of trafficking and has an established rapport with them, the next step is asking if they would like help. 
We initially received a 911 phone call of a, a residential structure fire. Upon our first arrival, the type of smoke that was emanating from the, the structure was indicative of it being a basement fire. We did as much as we could for suppression efforts, and unfortunately, five Mexican nationals perished in that fire, uh, ranging in age from 16 to 23 it became a criminal investigation and almost immediately we were working in concert with our county uh, fire investigators, uh, our state investigators, as well as our federal partners. Almost from day one we were able to determine that they were being not only housed in this residence um, but also not free to roam about the community or free to leave at any given time. I I've been in this business for more than 27 years uh, and as a former detective and a commander of an investigation section I can tell you this was really one of the more horrific crime scenes that we would actually see. Labor trafficking victimization takes on a myriad of forms and we are seeing more investigations every day mainly due to evolving societal awareness. It is no less insidious and no less of a crime as sex trafficking. As with sex trafficking, traffickers lure unsuspecting victims using very clever methods. Scores are smuggled in from overseas. Anywhere cheap or free labor is sought, such as in agriculture, domestic service, day labor work, and in less desirable businesses and industries, predators will snatch up their prey and trick them into servitude. We will explore how victims of labor traffickers are exploited, sometimes with gruesome outcomes. With the foreign nationals, you have a very vulnerable population. And the reason is, many of these people are here illegally or came here legally under a certain type of visa and then overstay their visa and are now illegal. What happens in that case is you get these unscrupulous individuals and organizations that know that now they have a big hammer on these people. They get control of their identity documents and either we're going to deport you, this is their threat, or we're going to turn you over to law enforcement, be arrested, you go to prison. They say all these outlandish threats to get control over these people. But many of them, unfortunately, where they come from, no matter what the situation is here, is way worse in their home country or the situation they came from. So they're willing to endure these horrible, horrible working conditions or things that they're asked to do so that they can get an opportunity to send even a little bit of money back to their family or just get out of the situation where they're in. The ability to control someone's documents is very, very important to traffickers of foreign nationals. They will take the, they will hand someone their passport and visa as they enter the United States so that they enter legally and then gather, if it's a group of people, they'll gather all the documents and hold them. So, and tell them, tell the uh, victims that if you leave this building, if you try to go work somewhere else, you won't be able to do it because I have your documents. Labor abuse doesn't always present itself strictly in a physical form and is often with symptoms and signs beyond the presenting injury or infection. Physicians and healthcare providers need to look for any telltale evidences of abuse such as poor body weight, signs of exhaustion, poor posture, old injuries that were left untreated, a depressed demeanor, reluctance to communicate, and fearfulness to name just a few. Again, our speakers will suggest what to look for beyond the presenting injury as you encounter a suspected labor trafficking victim. Making sure you have people who can speak as many languages as possible. Make sure you have access to translators you can trust. And make sure your questions are not judgment-laden. It takes a very long time. It can take a very long time to have a person who's been this traumatized trust you enough to tell you the truth. Usually their fear of the trafficker will overcome any uh, ability to tell you their whole story. And so like uh, domestic violence and child abuse and all medical personnel have been trained in those areas, we know that it may take um, more than one conversation. It may take a very long time before someone decides they can trust you with the information. And that's really frustrating because if you're in an ER, this may be your one chance to talk to someone. As healthcare providers, when we suspect labor trafficking during any medical intervention with patients where we observe physical and emotional indicators of abuse, we should follow the prescribed protocol as offered here by our federal and state guidelines. 
If minors under 18 years of age appear to be victims of forced labor, you must act on your suspicions as you would for sex trafficking of a minor and report those suspicions to authorities. For adult patients, at this time, healthcare providers are not required to report suspected instances of human trafficking to law enforcement. As with sex trafficking, should a physician or other healthcare professional suspect their patient may be a victim of labor trafficking and has established rapport with them, the next step is asking if they would like help. If an adult patient wants help getting away from their trafficker, law enforcement should be contacted, as well as the National Human Trafficking Hotline. If an adult patient is not yet ready to contact law enforcement, offer the number for the National Human Trafficking Hotline and report your suspicions to the hotline following the patient's departure. Remember, it is not our job as physicians and healthcare providers to further an investigation if we suspect that a victimization has occurred, but rather to follow the protocols to alert the NHTRC hotline and law enforcement. To recap, here is the reporting procedure. When physicians, nurses, or social workers have a reasonable suspicion that a child is a victim of CSEC or sex trafficking, they are mandated to contact authorities. Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, DHS, their phone number for central intake is 1-855-444-3911. If there appears to be an immediate threat, contact local law enforcement immediately by calling 911. The National Human Trafficking Hotline is available to answer calls 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in more than 200 languages. Again, call 1-888-373-7888. This number should be posted and readily available in all trauma care facilities. And it's really important that you know community members, local officials, law enforcement, all have a good understanding to not stick your head in the sand on this because this is something that's probably happening or has happened in most every community. Our presenters offer these added considerations that may assist in your encounters with suspected victims. As a society, as doctors, as professionals, we just have to be willing to let go of what we think we know. Taking a couple of seconds just to, to recharge and say, wait a minute, this might be something I need to look further into. We're not the legal aid, we're not police. That's not what we're here to do. We're here to get you safe. And so if you would like us to help you find some place to go tonight, then we can do that. And that's the place where a patient advocate could help. In a hospital situation, I think a victim should always have the feeling that this is a place for respite or for support or for rescue. And if that's their only opportunity maybe to separate themselves from a controller someday is to say, I have a backache or I have a UTI or something's wrong with me and that I need to go to the doctor. And for them to know that that is a place that can take care of them if they can get themselves there. There has to be education behind the law. There has to be um, money for services <laughs> behind the law. And I think that's where we need to go next is making sure that we've got the education in place, that we're working together, and that we've got the resources to be able to provide the comprehensive services that we need for survivors. With my pimp at that time, I would do whatever it is I had to do to please him, as sick as it sounds, so I wouldn't get beaten and he would continue to love me. We don't know someone's story. We may see someone at their worst. And I would think coming into an ER and being abused or is seeing them at their worst. We don't know what path that they've been on all their life that led them to that situation. And as physicians, as in individuals that are in the caring profession, the health care profession, to always be able to look at someone and look past the outer cover to what's really who they are. We've got to have health services, mental health services, behavioral health services, substance use disorder services, um, 
uh, physical health services, social services, counseling, and we've got to have the resources in place to really, really address all of the different physical and mental uh, health issues that these women have. But when that's all done, what's left? What piece are we forgetting, which we can't forget? And that is victim assistance. When you work with people like Common Ground, the Vista Maria, or the Manassa Project, and the, and the list goes on and on, where people are working together to provide help for victims of uh, human trafficking. Because what you don't want to do is go through this, you know, the legal process, and we're going to do that. We also need to think about the young woman. How do you get uh, her back on her feet? How do you provide hope? How do you provide renewal? How do you make sure that uh, she has a chance to have a journey that's, that's positive? And that's really what this is all about. I want to thank you for taking the time to participate in this educational presentation. Please make the victims of human trafficking more visible so that they can get the help they need, the help that they deserve. While there is greater awareness, it is believed that far too many continue to fall through the cracks. This must change, and your efforts are key. I end my comments with a specific call to action, and I want two things from you. First, within the next seven days, I want you to take 15 minutes to identify a phone number of a local resource that helps victims of trafficking and enter this number in your phone. Second, Within a month, and set this as a task on your smart device, commit to calling that number and making a visit to spend at least 45 minutes visiting with that resource to find out what they do for victims and how you can help them do better. I'm asking for less than an hour of your time to help avert a lifetime of misery for a fellow human being, a person that may have a very important role to play in your life or the life of one of your loved ones. Godspeed. Just like a trauma that comes into the emergency department that now is going to take up a lot of time, but you're going to spend that time because you recognize the importance of doing the right thing. If people, physicians, nurses, other care providers fully understand the magnitude of this problem and the impact that we can make, I think it'll rise to the same level as some of those high priority cases. You'll spend the time if you appreciate the need. So I had to be that voice for the women who are, who are already dead and those who are out there still struggling. Somebody had to stand up. Somebody had to be like, no, this is not right. A lady called me and she was like, Leslie, I'm ready to leave. Please come get me. And I came and got her. And then another one called. And another one called. And then I was able to talk to them and work with them because they were just like me. And they got jobs. They went through therapy. They did everything they were supposed to do in order to heal. And that's how Sacred Beginnings got started and it just grew.